Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art of the City. I'm your host, Ruth Ann, and today we have an amazing guest coming on. This gentleman is a photographer that has been capturing our national parks and exhibiting these beautiful uh, photographs all over the United States. So I'm very excited to bring on photographer Mark Burns, and let's see if we can get Mark on today. Mark Burns, welcome, welcome to Art of the City. And we're so pleased to have you here today. And I've heard many, many musings about you over the years along with other photographers. And I was just thrilled um, to have an opportunity to interview you today. So welcome. Well, thank you, Ruth Ann. It's, it's an honor to be here with you. So let's just talk, I know you have a lot of accolades. I know that you are probably one of the most famous uh, photographers for capturing all, the, all of our national treasures, these parks that we're um, worried about what's going to happen in the future to, to those. And you've documented those through your photography. But share a little bit with the viewer about your background and how you arrived at becoming um, so well known as a photographer. Well, um... My background as a photographer probably kind of ties into landscape photography because it probably can be traced back to uh, being a kid going on family vacations in the station wagon with my dad uh, driving my brother and I up to to New Mexico, northern New Mexico and Colorado uh, through Santa Fe and Taos and uh, Gunnison and um, into those areas of the of the um, southwestern Colorado and northern New Mexico. and. And I would, you know, be in the back of the station wagon from a very early age, you know, looking at the landscape. And 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 I would, I very early, probably like around, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, I was, you know, demanding a little Instamatic camera, Polaroid camera, that sort of thing. And I would, I would always, you know, be sitting there. I remember saying, you know, oh, stop, 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 you know, because I'd see the, you know, the mountain range or the the sky would look interesting to me or something like that. So. It goes back to a pretty young age, you know, as far as the, the, my uh, desire to do landscape photography, I think, or, or a, I, I guess a, something from within that, you know, led me to to really um, appreciating the landscape and and um, I guess the natural world and in, you know, those ways as far as, you know, seeing something that I thought was beautiful and wanting to capture it and then put it on a piece of paper so I could show my friends, you know, this is what this is where we were. This is what I saw. And so it goes back to a very young age. Um, That's awesome. Where did then, you grow up, by the way? In Houston, born and raised in Houston. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm just north of Houston right now. We're, we're, uh, we live now just north of Houston, Texas. So, um, but, you know, that's where, you know, from a very young age, I was, I had a, just a, a kind of a, you know, internal desire to, record images of things that I saw. And I think, you know, even looking back the in a pretty good eye, um, you know, kind of naturally for photography and for nature sort of thing. So, but then, you know, to, to get into your question, I, I, you know, I'm in high school then I'm, I'm, I'm on the high school yearbook team as the, you know, the photographer in the high school and you're doing everything, you're photographing the students, you're photographing the football games, the basketball games, all that stuff. And, and then I'm, you know, you graduate from high school and and I uh, looked at going to a photography college in Santa Barbara Brooks Institute and was a, was kind of recommended there by one of the Houston Chronicle photographers who was a dear friend at that time. And really, you know, was probably someone who, who taught me a lot um, about uh, sports photography at that time. He did a lot of um, uh, sports for the Houston Chronicle at that okay. point. And and then I so I got into professional sports photography because at that time, you know, I'm graduating from high school. I'm in my early 20s, I guess, uh, you know, 20, 21, 22. And and it was that was a fun thing to do, to be, you know, on the field of the professional sports teams, photographing the Houston Rockets and the Houston Oilers at that time. And wow. we had a professional soccer team here. So I, I started doing that from a very pretty young age. And I was you know, I was I was pretty competent at it. I knew what I was doing and, and I was, you know, delivering the goods, so to speak, with uh, as far as being able to give the team what they wanted. So um, but that, you know, I, I will say, you know, looking back and again, getting back to your question in a long about roundabout way, the the 
professional sports team work that I did, that opened a lot of doors, you know, because you're you're with the team at, at lots of different functions and you meet a lot of people. And, um, you know, I became feature photographer for the Houston Oilers or the report magazine. And then um, the USFL league started that in Houston, we had a team called the Houston gamblers and Jim Kelly was our quarterback who went on to become a star with the Buffalo bills. And uh, the USFL was a league that was around for several years, but it did create a lot of, um, you know, later NFL stars. So it was a good springboard for me. And, and I made the decision. I was offered the job at the Houston team as the director of photography. And then at that point had a, a full-time, uh, full-time job. So you're, you know, you're not paid by the picture or by the hour or by the game, so to speak, you're, you know, you're more on a, on a salary basis and you kind of do everything. Right. And, uh, so that was something that I had kind of worked up to, you know, now over, over, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine years and, um, you know, felt really good about what I was doing at that point. But again, the, the professional sports opened a lot of doors and you met a lot of people. And I think that so was you didn't have something to be that, a, a starving artist to begin with. It sounds like you had um, a relative amount of success yeah. right out of the gates. I, in some ways, yes, that's true. You know, I, I remember uh, I had a, you know, a pretty nice home that I rented in Quail Valley neighborhood. And when I worked with the Houston Oilers, that was uh, where a lot of the team lived at that time. And, um, you know, I was doing the job and doing the work and I was young, but I was competent and, and I was giving them what they wanted. So, so you got to um, you know, rub some I, elbows there with, uh, yeah. you know, the top athletes and live in that world. Yes. What, oh, what very made much you so. think later about maybe shifting that? Because that sounds like a pretty good gig. Yeah, it was. And and that's, um, you know, I, I and I love doing it then because I was their age, you know, pretty much maybe, a, you know, within a year or two or three of the players, but yeah, it was very, you were very much a part of the team and you were, you know, flew on the team plane to a lot of the games and you're, you know, in the doing pretty much everything they did, you know, in the hotels before the games and traveling with them and all that stuff. So it was a good gig. I enjoyed it very much. And I uh, really, you know, looking back, um, I'm glad I had that experience. I mean, I think everything that I've done up to this point has, you know, kind of added to the foundation of knowledge that I have and, and, you know, just broaden my ability to be a good photographer because you, you've done, I've done different types of photography. So, but you know, what I you're did doing now is very different because you were almost in essence doing a um, figurative, if you will, action sports photography, which I would imagine is very different than capturing landscape. But what did you learn from that? Because I'm sure that within, because I've been looking at your, your compositions are really beautiful. I mean, you, you're capturing these beautiful places and we'll get into that. But I think, you know, from an, as an art dealer, I'm always looking at an artist's composition. But what did you well, get from learning how to capture those, those people and movement that translated into what you're doing now? Well, I, I like what you're saying because I'm I consider myself a composition based photographer, you know, and really always have even back to the sports days. You know, there were it's kind of funny. I would frequently at games you, you have the press pool or the press photographers that are with the newspapers and the the sports magazines and all that. So you kind of have this in football as the game, as the you know, the uh, balls going down the field, the the you know, the mass of photographers, you know, 15 or 20 of them are kind of going with it, you know, back and forth. And normally they're on the front side of the action, trying to catch what's coming, you know, toward them, you know, that direction. But I would, I would quite often find myself being the one sole person going the opposite direction of where that mass was going. And I thought it was kind of interesting because I'm thinking in my head, you know, I, I kind of want the, I want to capture the game, within the game sometimes, you know, the, I want to capture what the fans faces look like as the actions coming toward them from the backside, maybe, you know, because that was more interesting to me, what, you know, what the fans reaction was, you know, sometimes, and you got the football game in the front and you can get some of that action, but you've also got all the fans, you know, and when you, when you're in a game like that, I used to love being able to have, you know, you, you can just, isolate and composition any portion of that stadium and you've got you know hundreds of 
people in the little seats that are sitting there and you can look at all these faces and see different reactions and hands up in the air and things like that when things Very are happening. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was it was more, you know, what's the story within the story kind of thing is what I was thinking in my head. Right. So the composition I was looking for was was more, you know, along those lines a lot of time. I mean, I would have obviously assignments where they would say we want this kind of picture of the quarterback, you know, with the ball or this Right. This running back with the ball or something where you would go do that the work that you were asked to do. But then you would, you know, I would go back to my kind of, um, you know, more artistic, you know, angle where I was seeing, you know, what in my mind's eye I was wanting to capture and wanting to get. So, um, you know, I think that that was always something with the sports work that I remember. I vividly remember now looking back was that there were so many times when the mass of photographers were going one way and I was going the other way. And they would look at me like, where, you know, where are you going? You know, we're you know, down here. But I'm How thinking. How did that translate later into, and we'll get into that, but I'm just curious, you know, because I'm working with artists and you're an artist. I haven't really worked with a lot of photographers. Mm -hmm. but, you know, the artist's minds are so different than the way that people who are not artistic, the way right. you view the world. And so it's, to me, what's really fascinating is here you're going from the sports industry, a lot of action, a lot of movement to a completely different, um, you know, terrain, if you will. Right. And what did you learn from being a sports photographer that you feel like you've been able to utilize with your beautiful landscape portraits? Well, you know, I don't know that what I learned that may be translated into the landscapes. I mean, it was it was the, um, you know, the uh, maybe patience. You know, I mean, I, I think patience is one of the biggest things that one of the biggest virtues that I think I have in landscape photography, because I spend hours and hours sometimes just waiting. And that's because I am a composition based photographer. So when I did the National Park Project, that was that was 20, 2010 through 2015, five, but four and a half years of photography. Um, and there were 59 national parks at that time. So it was a pretty, it was a major undertaking to, yeah. I was constantly on the road and you're trying to get, and I did it all in black and white. That was my timeless bridge back to the past century. That this, the project was done uh, for the hundred year anniversary of the national park service, which was in 2016. So black and white is what I wanted. That's what I really love doing. Love and uh, and what I wanted to be my bridge back to 1916 or 100 years ago when the Park Service was founded. And so that makes it a little harder, I think, because you're you're you know, you're to get an iconic shot of the net of the park in black and white. Sometimes it, you have to have other elements at play, you know, the atmosphere, the uh, backlighting from the sun, um, you know, different things, shadows, you know, whatever it may be that adds that kind of that third element that makes it really kind of grab you when you look at it. So, um, so composition back to that was, that was always what I was, what I, how I worked, I would go into a park and, and maybe spend two days just driving around looking for composition. And I would, I would look, you know, from sunrise to sunset and you kind of in your mind make notes, you know, that's obviously a, the most basic thing is that, you know, that's going to be a great sunrise spot. If that's going to be a, a good sun evening spot, you know, afternoon, late evening spot. Um, but, you know, it would be finding composition. And then when the weather would then watching the weather to see what the weather is doing. And I would always try to, you know, be working around, you know, some sort of, clouds or atmosphere or weather change happening when you, when you, you know, can be there when it's a storm is kind of coming in or something's breaking up and clearing up because that's when you get the most dramatic skies and you get these little rays, you know, rays of sun that are coming through the clouds and that kind of stuff that really adds to the, to the, uh, you know, the image, I think, and adds to the impact of it and kind of grabs you, you know, inside. So, you know, that's, how I would work was, was composition based and, and, uh, you know, back to the sports thing. I mean, I think going that other direction from the, the other photographers was again, more, I was looking for a composition that included what was happening with the players, what they were doing, but also the fans and what they were feeling and experiencing. So I, I've really always, I think would say I've been very composition oriented, you know, and I think, you know, what I had, it's funny, I had one time, a, um, you know, a, 
like a magazine will want to photograph and the art director person calls and says, you know, well, what part of this is important because, you know, we're going to crop it, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, what part of it is important? Every, every friggin' millimeter of it's important. That's why you're, that's why it's what it is. You know, I mean, it's not, I didn't design, I didn't take the, make the photograph for you to chop it in half and use half of it, you know, because that's what fits in your space. You know, it's, it's a, uh, so that's, I think one thing that makes, um, you know, the, a composition based photographer crazy is, you know, when magazines want to take a, you know, a panoramic image and make it a square, you know, or something, sure. it, it doesn't, well, it doesn't translate. It sounds to me though, just, you know, listening to what you're saying is that the compositions, obviously you put a lot of time and energy into getting that right shot, if you will. But at the same time, it sounds like you're trying to evoke an emotion. Um, oh, yeah, you know, what absolutely. you're talking about is, is um, the response of the viewer. You know, you're talking about the shadows and the light and the way that it makes you feel when you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. How long did that project take you to to be able to photograph all those parks? Well, it was uh, it was 2010 to 2015. It opened uh, it opened November, I think November 30th, 2015 uh, was when we had the opening. And the 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 goal was it was an exhibit that was exhibited in six museums uh, through 2016, which was a centennial year. So. Um, you know, it was in each venue. Well, actually, I even had to double it up some. I had two full sets uh, of photographs. So at, at one time we had, you know, uh, the um, LBJ Presidential Library Museum in Austin had it on display while it was also on display at the Pearl Fincher Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. So there were two sets that were that were split up. But um, the project took uh, it was five year project wow. with about six about six months of just kind of creating the infrastructure and the um, I had a great advisory committee um, that was put together and they really saved my life and probably made the project work because, you know, I, I could not, it was bigger than me being able to do everything. We had, you know, yeah. it had to go through a nonprofit um, entity in Houston that, that helped us, uh, you know, do it so we could um, take in some donations from companies that wanted to, to participate. Um, and, four and a half years of photography. And at the, in the end, you know, I thought in the, when you're, you know, when you're in 2010 or 2011 and you think, yeah, I've got, you know, I got eight, seven, eight, nine parks, you know, in the can, so to speak. And I'm, uh, you know, kind of, you know, feel like I'm getting on a, on a good wave here to do it. And you're, you feel pretty good about it. And then it's, you know, it's 2013 and you're, you got 25 or 30 parks done and, and then day you wake up and realize, gosh, this is, I got to be done. And <laughs> yeah. I got to be done in two, two years. And I still got, you know, 29 parks to go. And you kind of oh, go, boy. oh my God. And those parks are the hardest ones to get to, you know, because oh, you've, you, you've kind of already done the ones that are, that are, you know, none of them were relatively close, but. Um, so they, what was they, that uh, like? I mean, what, what, how did you actually get there? Were you camping, backpacking? Did you go with people? What, Paint a little yeah. picture for us of that. Well, I was okay. I was, I, I had a, I, I bought a Toyota FJ Cruiser that I, I now call my most valuable player because that drove to every national park in the lower 48 at least once and multiple times to a number of them. Toyota was actually a sponsor also. They helped us out. That was after I had purchased the vehicle. They, they came on board and were, oh, uh, were great. one of the sponsors. Um, Gulf States Toyota is who it was. But, um, so I drove, I think I think I had like 160,000 miles of driving to do the project um, in the four and a half years. And then um, I flew to some in 2014 20, and 2015, I flew to Alaska twice for kind of a July, August um, in 2014. And I think... Um, August and maybe into the first week of September in 2015 because driving to Alaska was a little too far to go, you know, yeah, for what long, I you long know, long what I wanted to do. Yeah. And then flew to Hawaii for the parks in Hawaii. And um and then from Hawaii from Honolulu flew to American Samoa for the um American Samoa National Park that we have in uh 
in American Samoa out in the South Pacific. So that was, uh, that was by far the, you know, you're on the other side of the world at that point. And, you know, we, but we do have a national park there. I didn't and, even know we have a national park there. So I'm sure a lot yeah. of the viewers are going to be looking yeah. at that, uh, those um, photographs you took, because I don't think any of us have even yeah. ever seen any of those. Yeah, it's um, it's I uh, stayed in a little town called Pago Pago in American Samoa, and back when I went, it may be different now, but when I went, the plane would would fly from Honolulu and it would drop you off on a like a Sunday, or maybe drop you off on a Friday morning or Friday night late, and you'd be there all week, and it, it wouldn't come back until like the the following Sunday night or Sunday, you know, whenever it was. So you were basically in the on the island in the town for a week was kind of the minimum, and and I thought, you know, well, that's you know, I'm going to just kind of be there kicking around for two or three days because I'll probably get it done in two or three days. And and I was wrong. The weather ended up being bad and it was rainy every day until really the last day, I think. And I I needed every day that I had to get the photograph that I got. And it kind of miraculously, it, it, the sky just kind of opened up for maybe four or five hours where it was kind of a partly cloudy, kind of a nice, you know, uh, sun peeking out, which was really good for the photograph. And um, oh, that's a that's no, got, well, that's uh, a great story too. I love that. But uh, yeah, so a, a lot of the time, wherever I was, was you know looking for composition and then waiting, just waiting for the the atmosphere to cooperate. One one nice thing I will say about nowadays, um, you know, there's so much technology you can utilize in weather apps and things like that that I that I took advantage of. I'm a very very traditional photographer in my landscape sort of work. We shot a lot on film, a lot, some digitally, but a lot still shot a lot on film and the film I would then digitally scan and then create kind of a hybrid workflow between the, the, the analog film image and creating a digital file that I would then print digitally. Everything was printed digitally, but it was, um, it was some captured on film, some with, with digital capture, but so I, you're I do shoot. the, the old school, traditional way along with bringing in digital and yeah a hybrid yeah. of both yeah i really like that workflow i like the look of film film has the you know a little bit it has a different look you know in a lot of cases right. and the grain grain and film you know i really love sometimes um and i think sometimes it can contribute to part of that feeling you know that you're that you're getting from something when you have the grain there and um, um, I shoot a lot now with a, with a six by 17 centimeter panorama camera. It's a Fujifilm GX 617 for anybody out there that knows what that is, but there, it, it creates a large, uh, panoramic negative. And I really, really like that a lot. And one thing that I've done, the, the new exhibit that I'm working on now is called American landscapes, and it's going to open in 2023 at the Pearl Fincher Museum of Fine Arts and, and, uh, Houston here. And, I'm doing, I have a, a handful of photographs that I've created or shot on that, on that panoramic, panoramic film. And then I'm printing the black and white images, but I'm hand coloring like they used to do a hundred years ago or more where they would be hand tinted and they have that kind of hand tinted look. So that's, that's a way I found that I kind of like making a black and, or, or, you know, that's how I like to do color stuff. You know, it's like, I'll take the black and white picture, but then kind of hand tint it, you know, and, and do it that way because I, I really I, I really love and appreciate a lot of the great color photography that I see nowadays and sure. there's some just beautiful beautiful color photography of, of the landscape out there and it's you know the cameras now and the sensors and the sensitivity allow a lot of shots and you know right before sunrise that are just spectacular and right after sunset maybe and they're just some beautiful images in color and that they get all the nuances you know because of the the tonal range that some of the sensors have now of these real subtle you know rosy colors in the sky and and things like that so really some nice stuff being done by a lot of photographers but i say you know i want them to do that and they can excel at that and and i'm just going to kind of stick to my my black and white thing but when i do you know, think of something in color, I'm doing the hand tinting now, the hand colorizing. So you're almost bringing a little bit of a vintage look in because I've seen, I like, that. Yeah, I've, exactly. you, know, you know, I've yeah. seen things from, you know, the forties and fifties where they did um, do mm -hmm. the hand color and it, it looks really, you can, it almost captures a time period and it's interesting right. that you're bringing that back in. So it'll be interesting to see if it harkens back 
to that time. I did have a yeah. question since you've been so involved with the parks. What's your feeling mm -hmm. been like in the last few years about all of the talk about parks being sold? And I know as a Native American, that's a really important issue to us because a lot of those parks really sit on Native land, even though yeah. they are part of you know the federal government. They're still technically part of a lot of the communities that surround that those parks. Um, specifically, right. I'd say, you know, Navajo Nation, they have a lot of the uh, national parks really sit almost within the, the boundaries of their reservation. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I have a lot of respect for the Native Americans and they're, they're you know, uh, you know, when I go on to one of the reservations that I was in, well, a month or a year ago, this month, uh, around the middle of December, that's when I did the some photography in Monument Valley and um, and got that photograph Navajo Moon and um, right. went on to Ship Rock, which I've I've been trying to get a great photograph of Ship Rock for years. And every time I'm driving, I'm in the area or going by it, the weather's not cooperating. Um, but I I you know I the there's so many issues there that that. Uh, I probably should start off by saying, you know, the National Park Project probably changed my life in a number of ways. And one of the ways is is political views, mm. probably because of, you know, uh, what you would kind of what I would consider abuses of the land. Um, you know, some of the uh, I got to be careful, you know, I got a lot of friends that, you know, do <laughs> certain jobs that, you know, I don't want to, you know, insult. But um, I'm I've I you know, the the parks and the, and the land, you know, is, is really, that's kind of the, um, those are the cathedrals that I worship, you know, that I, you know, in, in many, in many ways, like Native Americans have a respect for the land, obviously. And, and, you know, I would feel that respect, obviously, when I'm on their property, but the, um, you know, when parks like we in the last couple of years, Bears Ears in Utah, you know, which you may be familiar with Bears Ears National Monument, that yeah. was literally cut in half, you know, by the government uh, from and and then it's, you know, used for oil exploration or whatever they may, you know, whatever they may do. And I just I have a real problem with that. You know, when the I think when the land is set aside, it should be protected and, you know, not be able to be influenced by these, um, you know, these every four or eight year political parties that, you know, one has one view of how they want to use it and one has another view. And I actually did a photograph that I had in my, in my Grand Canyon exhibit that was up a couple of years ago that was, uh, uh, it was, I'll have to find it and send it to you. You can see it, but okay. it was a bunch of, it was a long, long panoramic photograph and it was a bunch of red and it was a black and white photo photo, but I had these red and blue bands that went through it. And then I had under at each break in the, between the colors, a date. And it was, it represented the last hundred years of political administrations between Democrat and Republican and how, how many times the grand Canyon in this case, you know, was, was going, was affected by, you know, a, a different political administration and what they may decide that they wanted to do something and and I really became a, a believer that this these lands need to be protected and they need to always be protected and they need to not be subject to to something you know when you're talking about something that's 60 million years old and then you've got right. you know a four year political administration that can that can you know affect that you know I mean it's it's like we need to think of it in more I think in more special terms is you know we still have this undeveloped natural beauty that needs to remain undeveloped nat natural beauty for our generation and our kids generation and so on and so forth to enjoy and it's so uh, true and, now, and i think too just asking possibly those people who have been here from the very beginning which are the native people on this land you know mm -hmm. asking for their opinion about how their terrain is affected because i think you know, that's where I feel there are some wrongs that could be made right if there was mm -hmm. just the questions asked about what is your opinion of the usage of this land. I think we could really um, create a dialogue that's much needed within, 
the you know the conditions of native um, culture and right. being you know being part of the Americas now. And I think that someone like you, you're really shedding light on the beauty of this land and the importance of it remaining. So that as you know, we have our children that come along, they're able to experience this beauty that um, is untouched. And it's really right. important, I feel, that we leave, we need to leave some areas untouched. Um, it's, Absolutely. You know, it's just otherwise what what are we what are we working so hard to um, to obtain as American people, even as a Native American, um, if we right. can't keep these treasures that are disappearing right before our eyes? And I really appreciate you as a photographer because you're taking the time to tell that story. And mm -hmm. as a Native person, that's really what you're doing is you're using these pictures as storytelling. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, that's what I feel like when I'm doing it is that I want to, I want to try to be creating something that's preserving, uh, you know, the, or making people, uh, you know, hopefully become aware of what the beauty that we have and, and understand, you know, value in it being just as you just said, you don't, it, it doesn't have, the land doesn't have to do anything other than be there you know, for us, it doesn't have to, you know, produce an oil well, it doesn't have to produce a gas well, it doesn't have to, you know, have a, uh, you know, a building on it for recreation, it doesn't have to do anything other than, you know, really just be there to be, to be appreciated by those that can walk up and, and, and look at it and appreciate it and, and say, you know, that's, that's something special that needs to be preserved, you know? And I think, so I, I do, when I, when I take my photographs of the, the landscapes, I feel like inside, like I'm doing a portrait almost. It's like, you know, you look at a scene and you approach it kind of, you know, as a portrait photographer would, you know, and right. trying to say, I want to, I want the lighting to be, you know, to do justice to this subject. I want, you know, I want to feel the, you know, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to photograph what I'm seeing. I'm trying to photograph what I'm feeling yes. when I'm there, you know, and, and, and uh, that's hard to do, you know, because a lot of these parks are so like the grand Canyon. I mean, I, I probably went there 20 over 20 something times in the last, you know, eight, nine years. And every time I walk up to the rim, you just go, my God, look at this. It's, <laughs> right. it's unbelievable. You know, I mean, right. it's just, it's, it's just, it's just to see, these layers in time and this, this massive, you know, Canyon, that's just, there's just kind of life, you know, you're, you're just looking at all this, this time, you know, and you see this river at the bottom, you know, this faint little river down there. And, and there was a story I had said in some talks that I did once when I was there maybe seven, eight years ago during, the, I think doing the national park project. And I was at the grand Canyon on the South rim, uh, pretty close to the El Tovar hotel. And they, they had, there were people, a lot of people around walking on the, on the South Rim trail. And there was a dad with his daughter that he picked up and kind of set on the, on the little stone wall there to look down. And he said, see the, see down there, the water, that's the river that, that made all this. And I thought, you know, to myself, as I'm walking away, I, you know, I just kind of went, was walking by, but I heard that. And I thought it's not, that it made it, it's making it right now. But that's, that's the time, you know, the time that we can't, you know, we're in this, we comprehend time, like, you know, what are you going to be doing in three hours or what are we going to be doing tomorrow or next week? Well, this is what 60 million years looks like, you know, mm -hmm. it's still the river down there is doing just what it's been doing, you know? So it's still carving away, you know, it's, it's creating right. a bigger Canyon as we look at it, but well, we don't, we sometimes don't comprehend it that way. Well, that's the beauty of what you're bringing to the world through the lens and through your eyes, ultimately, is you're capturing these moments that we hope will continue. And it's so needed right now because we're at this age of technology with where everything's moving at such a rapid rate that I think right. we as human beings, we're almost being reprogrammed to feel like everything has to be moving and everything has to be um, mm -hmm. making something to entertain us. 
And that's right. the beauty of what you're capturing is, is that it's not there for entertainment. It's there because it's important. And we as human beings need it. We need nature. Right. Without it, we don't exist. So it is such an important part of who we are in humanity across the world. Nature has to remain without humans going in and trying to turn it into something else, trying to pull the oil out of the ground or grind it up and turn it into what we say is a precious metal. It's precious right. just the way it is and it's needed just the way it is. And I think you are really shedding light on that to bring these exhibits to life and to utilize your talents so that when we're not here anymore, and hopefully things, we start reflecting on life in a different way. You're going to be one of those artists that was a catalyst to that idea and to that story. And it's just so important. And I don't think maybe you even recognize the importance of it. You know, maybe we won't until we're not here anymore. Yeah. But it's really a right. great thing what you're doing. And for many different reasons, other than just capturing a beautiful photograph which you do very well 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 thank you thank you i uh no i i truly love when i'm out there and this you know during the covid world that we've been in for the last nine months or so it's been difficult kind of being uh you know homebound here trying to catch up on work i, I have been able to do some printing and do some other things and um you know kind of do that sort of work that i needed to get done and get caught up on but i'm certainly um you know itching to get back out and and um, I've got a, I've got about 15 sites on my uh, American landscapes exhibit list to still photograph, you know, for that. So I'm <laughs> slowly trying to check those off. But, um, um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, the, I think the, that's exactly what you're saying is how I approach it. I mean, I'm, I feel very like I'm in a sacred place when I'm in some of these parks, and I try to uh, treat them with great respect and. Um, and do justice to the photographs that I take of them, you know, to show um, really just the the natural side of of that site and that image. And some people have, you know, kind of asked me, well, why, you know, why do you not have any people in any of your photographs that I've had in the in these so far in the exhibits? I think maybe there's one or two of them that had a might have had a person in it, and and I had um, I had one. Uh, the the Acadia National Park photograph, I did choose to to put the uh, Bass Harbor Lighthouse in the picture because it was just such a kind of a Maine photograph, you know, from the state of Maine. It just looked right for that photograph. And But other than that, and maybe one other one, there really were not, I don't think, any man-made, um, you know, elements in the pictures or pictures of man. It was just, and I tried, you know, to on purpose not to have that, you know, not to have... Right people sometimes it's it can be good and and when some of the scenes to have just a little silhouette of a person maybe in there because you get the scale of of how massive the the rock formation may be or the or say a you know a, a sequoia tree in sequoia national park in king's canyon or in sequoia national park right you know these giant redwoods and sequoias you know you when you look at just a picture of the tree it's hard to express the scale of how massive these are, you know, unless you have some human element in there that you can kind of, you know, judge it by. But, but I decided that, you know, kind of early on, I wanted to just keep it natural and kind of um, really try to just photograph the natural world in, in that way in, in these places. So keeps it timeless you know. that way, I think too. Yeah. So I have one more question for you. What okay. would you, what would you uh, give, advice to a young person that was wanting to become a photographer. And I know that, you know, you were fortunate because you kind of, you know, you yeah. got some opportunity that I think a lot of artists just in general, they struggle when they're young that, well, maybe I'm not going to be able to make a living at this or how am I going to, um, you know, have a family someday and, and be able to contribute, what would be your advice to someone who has that gifting and passion for photography? Well, I think, I think, uh, you know, work, work hard, be, be ready to put in some time and work and don't, uh, don't try to do something. Uh, don't, don't look for 
um, instant gratification, maybe, you know, really try to put some time in, learn the craft. I mean, one thing with technology nowadays is it allows you to, allows a lot of photographers to create some pretty good images without really having to do a whole lot. You know, you can, right. um, you can create some pretty good, pretty good images without thinking about it too much. But I think, um, you know, trying to learn the foundations of photography, learn the basics, learn how to do film photography, um, even though it's not going to really be any part of what you're going to need to know for digital photography uh, in, in a lot of ways. But I think, you know, one thing that I tell people when I do the talks that I do a lot is that, um, well, I got let me back up. People ask me the question. So the, one of the photographs and they'll say, so did you go into the park and you take like 2000 pictures and you look at them, you know, a week later or that night or whenever, and you pick out, you know, the two or three best ones. Cause you, you, you know, you kind of use the shotgun approach of just taking hundreds and hundreds of pictures and you, you were lucky enough to get a good one. And I say, no, not at all. I mean, I, I may have been in, in some of these parks for, you know, four or five days and I may have only shot 30 images, you know, or something, because again, I was a, a, a composition based photographer looking for composition always. And when I would find the composition that I wanted, then I would wait for the atmosphere to cooperate and kind of give me what I wanted in the atmosphere to, you know, as long as I could, there were some occasions in parks where, you know, you have seven, eight, nine, 10 days of clear blue skies. And, you know, you, you kind of got to finally say, I'm just going to adapt to the, what the weather has given me and, and work with what I'm being given, you know, and you got to kind of make the best of that. So, right. um, but my, my main, you know, way of working was to find the composition and then wait for the atmosphere to give me that interesting third element, you know, the, a little bit of fog or the, the low clouds that come in or the, the rays of sunlight that are coming through the clouds that are, that are hitting a, you know, a rock formation in the background or whatever it may be that, and that, and that stuff happens. And when it does happen, it, it may only last for 30 seconds or, or 15 seconds or, it rarely lasts more than a minute or two, you know, so you have to be, you really have to be aware. I think, you know, what I would say is be patient and be aware of what's happening in front of you because the, the scenes that you, a lot of the shots that I've would say, you know, end up being the picture the photograph that I, that I picked or that I chose that, that lighting may have only lasted for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute or so. And then, then this, the clouds move through and, or the clouds block the sun or it changes or whatever is happening is always changing. So I think it's, it's, it's a combination of being extremely patient, but also being very observant and being aware of what's happening, um, you know, with the sun and with the light and, and with, with your subject matter that you're looking at. So, um, and then another thing I'll say real quick in closing here is I, I would kind of in, combination with that um i um, in except for alaska where we were in planes on a couple of the photographs that i did of the massive glaciers which were like 25 miles long and the only way you could see the scale and the massive size of the glacier was to get into a plane in the air so we were in some bush planes for a couple of those shots but everything else was always is always done on a on a tripod a camera on a tripod with the cable release very methodical. So, and I think part of that, that methodical approach is, is part of your, you're kind of building the foundation of the photograph there because I'm you know, number one, you find the composition and then you set up the tripod, you set up the camera, you put the cable release in, you're framing the shot to what your eye is saying. This is what I want my composition to be. So you're kind of committing. And, and I, I shot a lot. I shoot a lot with an eight by 10 Deerdorf camera a four by five camera, these, like I said, the six by 17 panorama camera. And when you were shooting with an eight by 10 deer dwarf camera or a four by five camera for that matter, that's when you have the dark cloth over your head and you're back behind it on the ground glass, you know, sh focusing and, and, and uh, framing the image and everything. So you're, you have to really commit to that, that composition that you're seeing is that's going to be my shot. Cause I'm not going to be able to pick it up, you know, real quick and turn it the other way and, uh, you know, do a whole lot of good. It's, you're kind of saying, this is going to be my photograph. Now we're going to sit here and wait for the, everything to hopefully come together and get the photo. But if I would, if I shoot digital, I'm doing the same exact thing. And I think that's where, that's where something that I tell the younger 
people a lot is that it, I think that process and that approach makes you a better photographer because you're having to look and use your eyes to find the composition. And then you're setting up the camera in a methodical way on the tripod, the camera's on it. You put in, in the case of a digital camera, an electronic cable release into it. And you, you then can use your eyes to see, you know, you're, you then can be more aware of your surroundings because your camera is set. It's, you know, locked and loaded, so to speak. And you're, right. you're then looking at the clouds and looking at the atmosphere and waiting for, you know, for that split second or that moment when, when you kind of get that special light that you're, that you're wanting. So it sounds like your advice would be, be very patient and also mm -hmm. do your homework because when I'm listening to what you're saying, it sounds like you have really thought every aspect of your craft through and that you are very much in the moment when you are getting set on capturing just that photograph. Because when I talk to a lot of people who shoot digital, it almost sounds to me like the opposite, like they're throwing a lot of mud against the wall and hoping that they get a shot that sticks. And, right. you know, when you're saying you may shoot, you know, 30 photographs in a day, that's almost unheard of in the digital world. And so I really yeah. have to, I feel very impressed by your approach um, that you, you really think it through. And I would imagine some of that comes from shooting film because just, I mean, I did a little tiny bit of photography. I would be even embarrassed to say that I actually did it. I think in junior high school, I took a class. But back in that day, um, you didn't waste film because you didn't right. get a lot of shots at it. I mean, you know, it was expensive, even as a kid, right. that was one thing. And then the other thing is anything that you shot, you had to develop. And that was its own story. So you didn't really want to have to develop a lot of things that weren't that great. Um, right. I mean, that much I do know as a complete, you know, novice. But I appreciate your approach. And I just... Um, I'm just really impressed with you devoting your time to this. I think it's important. And I hope that we get a next generation of young people watching this who get inspired by you and want to continue to push forward in this art form because it truly is. And um, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you, what you're doing and uh, sharing it with us today. Well, thank you, Ruth Ann. I really appreciate being here and, uh, and being invited to be part of this. So, Mark, what's the best way if somebody wants to follow you, wants to come to your exhibits once the COVID ends, or maybe even wants to purchase some of your art, where's the best place that they can go? Well, probably probably on Twitter would be the best place to, best place to follow. Um, um, I, I'm at MarkBurn77 is the, is the Twitter uh, handle there. So, um, but I would say that would be the best way to, to see what's going on. I put a lot of things on there and we'll be putting more, more and more on there about the American landscapes exhibit. That's going to, I'm going to really start the marketing for that in, um, in the first quarter of 2021. So you'll be seeing more about that exhibit coming up that again opens in February of 2023. Um, but yeah, I'd say that would be the place to start. Um, and the website, markburnsphotographer.com go, you can check that out. And, um, as most websites, it's in need of an update, but it, uh, it's, uh, it's got some good material on there now, I think. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Keep doing what you're doing. And we're going to look forward to your upcoming exhibit and also having you on the show again. Well, thank you, Ruthann. Great okay. to be here and, and uh, good luck. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Art of the City. We look forward to seeing you on our next live streams. We will be airing on Saturdays uh, starting this coming week in December, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and that would bring us to 8 p.m. on the East Coast. So I hope you join us. Please, if you get a chance, go to our YouTube site, Art of the City. You'll be able to subscribe there, share the content with your friends. We do record everything and we put it up there at YouTube. So I hope you have a great day and I'll see you next time on Art of the City.